I'm I'm very confused. I came in here and it feels like we're not using the last fourth of the room. And I'm like, that that doesn't make sense, even in a non-COVID time of like people just like space and it's like, what are we doing right now? So what's up? No, you're fine. All right. Um Friends on Zoom, can you hear me? Yep. All right, and we can hear you. Thank you, Jemima. All right, well, welcome. Uh, it's good to be together again. Um, looking forward to our time together today. Uh, I don't have any announcements for us that I can think of. Um, I won't lie to you, I haven't thought that hard about it though. So if, if I'm forgetting something, um, should not be a surprise, but. 
I think, yeah, Brian. Yeah, this is, uh, this is why other people in this class are necessary uh, because we would get very little done uh, with just me here. So yeah, <laughs> um, I sent out um, in our email the past couple of weeks a link to the YouTube channel where um, just the recordings of these get posted. So if you ever miss a week and you find yourself thinking, uh, something didn't make sense, or I want to fill in some of the gaps of where we've been because I missed something where you have occasion to do that. Uh, the first week I sent it out for some people, the link didn't work for some reason. Um, but I think this past time we've sent it out, I haven't heard any complaints yet. So uh, take advantage of that. Um, it's not like there's anything high quality going on, but um, it would give you occasion to know where we've been and hopefully then fill in some of the gaps for where we're headed. And then uh, also, um, we've been talking about this. If there's a prayer request uh, card on your seat, if there's a way we can pray for you, we ask that you would fill one of those out and um, you can just give them to me at the end of class today or leave them on your seat and I'll uh, go around and grab them. But it gives us occasion to love and serve one another as we pray for one another. And so um, if you have ways we can do that, um, write those down. And, and obviously, I'm sure we talk about those things in our breakout groups as well. And so you'll share those things there. and. and uh, hopefully we'll care for each other in that way. So yeah. you want to make sure to get everyone has a breakout group. Yes, yeah. So um yes. Um at the end of class or kind of in the middle of class actually we'll break off into some smaller groups. If you've never been to one of those groups or you don't know where to go, um just come see me um right as class is ending and, and we'll get you split off with one. If you came here with someone today, uh you can just go to whatever group they go to that makes the most sense. But um, yeah, that's a, a big part of what we're doing and trying to foster community and relationships. And so um, don't be caught off guard when three fourths of the class gets up and moves to a new space. Uh, that's normal for us. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Brian. Um, with all of that said, um, let me just pray for us as we get started this morning. Father in heaven, we rejoice at the opportunity to be together. We thank you for uh, the warm sunshine that fills the windows. Lord, we thank you for safe travels to arrive at this place this morning. Lord, we thank you that you use um, this group and the relationships formed in it to uh, mold us and encourage us and uh, to challenge and confront us in our sin. And, and Lord, we're so thankful for that, that uh, we call one another brothers and sisters in Christ, that in the Lord Jesus, you're making a new family and um, you've invited us into it in him. And so, Lord, we pray that our time together would reflect that today. Lord, that the way we uh, speak to and of one another would reflect our uh, familial status, that we would uh, have yearning affection for one another as we think about your goodness toward us and, and the gift that each and every one of us are to one another. Lord, as we look to your word, we pray that you would help us and encourage us, that you would uh, lift our eyes above the circumstances of today in order that uh, we might be able to see you for who you are, or that we might be rightly challenged by our sin and recognize uh, the, the myriad of ways that we look just like the rebellious people of Israel. So Lord, challenge us today, uh, instruct us in the way of truth. Lord, we pray not only that we would learn uh, just facts that would fill our head, but that you would transform us, Lord, that we would be uh, more like Jesus leaving today uh, than we were when we came. Lord, that is our great prayer, and we thank you that uh, you have all power in order to do that. And so we look to you to do it this morning. In Christ's name, amen. amen. If you guys would, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to Hosea into chapter 4. Um, if you've been here, hopefully you've noticed that we've been working our way through the book of Hosea, and so that will continue this morning. Um, Hosea and uh, chapter four, and we're just going to look at the first three verses this morning. I will read them aloud for us, uh, pray once more, and then uh, we'll, we'll dive in. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns 
and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Amen. Let me pray for us. Thank you guys for bringing chairs in. Father, thank you for this time together. Again, once more, we look to you for help, acknowledging that, Lord, we could rightly uh, do everything that we know is right this morning. And yet, apart from your grace and power, uh, nothing of substance would happen. And so we uh, cast ourselves entirely dependent on you, asking you to do what we cannot. In Christ's name, amen. So, um, it's been an interesting week uh, in a number of regards, but um, in one way, primarily in that when I sent out uh, the handout on Friday and sent out the weekly email that uh, I had a different understanding and outline of this text than I have today, now that it's Sunday morning. <laughs> so uh, that shouldn't shock anyone. Um, if you know me at all, you know that, um, yeah, uh, it is a, a labor of love to serve you in the scriptures. And um, it's a good reminder for us that um, whether it be me or uh, even my more senior colleagues, that we're all always learning from the scriptures. No one has arrived in, um, yeah, even uh, on a drive uh, to here yesterday, thinking about this text, I realized some of the things that I had missed. And so um, what I'm going to try to do is supplement the outline I've already given you with some of the, the new things that I think the Lord has been uh, helping me to see of how this text fits in to the bigger story of Israel how it's more than just three verses of uh, this is what Israel has done wrong, but it's actually the retelling of a story that's been going on from the beginning of time. So with that being said, you see on your handouts that we'll have uh, three sections. We'll look at what is lacking, what is present, and the consequences of it. Um, and so those will still be helpful for us, um, but let me try to fill in some of the gaps as we get started here. Um, once again, uh, I was asking Kira this morning, every Sunday morning, I'm, I uh, ride our stationary bike while I look over my notes again and, and try to begin to wrap my head around the text. And I was asking Kira, I was like, have you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? And she told me she has. I have not seen the movie Groundhog Day, but I understand the premise enough to say this, that the character is a man and he lives the same day over and over again. That's all I know about Groundhog Day. That's all I need to know for this morning. And so uh, that imagery came to my mind because what we see happening in these verses is that the story of Israel that has been told since Genesis 3 is being told again. It's happening again. And so Israel, as God's covenant people created in his likeness to image him to the world, is actually living the same story over and over and over again from Genesis 3 onward. And here's what I mean by that, uh, more than just in a general sense, I think we can see that as we look at the text. In the section of where we're going to see what is lacking, our first point, we see that it's Yahweh's indictment of some of the things that the people should have toward Yahweh. They should be faithful to him. They should have steadfast love. They should know him. You'll remember with me in the Garden of Eden when uh, sin breaks into the world, Adam and Eve are deceived that there are three categories of consequences that the Lord brings to bear in the sight of the people. And one of those, and primarily being that they are cast out of the garden, Adam and Eve are taken out of God's presence. They can no longer dwell with him in the way that they were intended to. And our first point, I think, accurately reflects that, that the communion that the people of God were supposed to have with God has been broken. It's what happened to Adam and Eve, but Israel has followed in their mother and father's footsteps. Secondly, we see that uh, they're swearing, lying, uh, what we've titled, what is present. You remember the second category of what happened in the fall is that God said he would put enmity between the man and the woman, right? That they would have contrary desires to one another. And that's reflected so clearly in these verses that Adam and Eve conflict entered into their relationship and Israel has followed suit. Their lives are marked by swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. And as we'll see, representative of all else of wickedness. The last uh, consequence of the fall that Genesis 3 details for us is that uh, there will be thorns and thistles when it comes to work, when it comes to tilling the land, things will not be as they ought to be. There is a disconnect between the land 
that Adam and Eve were created to rule over and now where they find themselves. In verse three, it explores for us this idea that the land is personified as mourning. The land in which they dwell, this promised land that God has given them is being harmed by their sin, impacted by their sin. They're reliving the story again and again. And so what we're going to turn our gaze to this morning is to see that this cycle of sin and rebellion and its consequences going on since Genesis 3 can only be reversed by one who will come and perfectly fulfill all that Israel lacks, namely the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with that said, uh, let me read the first half of verse one, which kind of sets the, the scene for us. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. You'll remember, O children of Israel was used three times in chapter three, this great chapter of God's love we looked at last week. And so we're being reminded that it's the same people that Yahweh is speaking to. In one chapter, he rightfully is reminding them of his covenant, steadfast, unending love. And at the same time, he can say of them that they are a wicked and rebellious people. They are simultaneously looking forward to the future hope of his restoration that he's promised and presently in rebellion against him. So hear the word of the Lord and hear carrying with it, not just this idea of uh, having your ears open, but of living in light of being shaped by allowing the change necessary to have its way in their hearts. It's a call to repentance. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. And you'll notice that uh, the land is repeated three times in these three verses. And um, as we'll see, and we looked at that, the land is significant for Israel and exile is the consequence of which they're facing. But the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. This is sort of like courtroom language, if you can imagine it with me, right? It's a righteous judge standing to read charges against a defendant. But what's up for grabs is not to determine the innocence uh, or the guilt of the defendant. They are guilty. Hosea has made that clear already to this point. But it's a indictment of their wickedness and sin, which carries in it an intrinsic call to repentance. Stop going in the direction that you're going. Stop living this way. I have a, a good buddy of mine who he, right out of college, served as a parole officer for juvenile uh, kids for several years. And he told me time and time again, of, this is what his conversations look like. He's sitting down with a young man and saying, listen to me. If you continue in this path that you're going in, you're going to ruin your life, right? You are headed towards destruction. Stop what you're doing. Change. Be different. That is what the Lord is setting before Israel here. A reminder of the consequences of sin that are to come upon them in pleading to repent and to turn back to their true and living God. So if that sets the stage for us, we get to the end of verse one, then where we see what is lacking. We read that there is no faithfulness in the people of Israel. We have to be reminded that although this might resemble a courtroom scene, that these aren't two strangers who are having it out in the courtroom. This is what has been personified as a married couple for us, Yahweh and his bride, Israel. And so it's not as if uh, these people who have never met each other are, are seeking restitution. These words, they're being said of a husband <clears throat> as if he's saying to his wife, you have not been faithful to me. You don't love me anymore. I'm starting to doubt if you even know who I really am. So although it's a courtroom scene, there is an intimacy to these words. And the reason that we're looking at these three verses in particular this week is because they set the stage for everything that happens through chapter seven. We're actually going to see that uh, these are the charges that are then just going to be elaborated on in the next couple of chapters, which will take in some bigger swaths. But we read, there is no faithfulness in Israel. This word in other places is translated integrity. There is no consistency, no wholeness. It carries with it that same sort of idea we talked about in James of not being a divided people, where our hearts are in, in love with two competing gods. The indictment against Israel is that there is no faithfulness. 
There is no devotion. They find themselves, right, as we've read, uh, it's whoever can do good for me most recently has Israel's allegiance. There's also, we read, no steadfast love. Similar to faithfulness, but uh, this word translated steadfast love here is one of the most commonly used and the most important in the Old Testament. It carries with it, there's no covenant commitment. There's nothing in Israel that, regardless of their circumstance, is committed to the marriage vows that they made at Sinai, to the covenant commitment they made to be Yahweh's people and for him to be their God. Instead, we find that they're a fickle people. They're milling about all, all over the place. And part of the problem is, is that they're not saying we want nothing to do with Yahweh. That might actually be easier. They're saying we want a little bit of Yahweh and a little bit of Baal and a little bit of anything else that might make our lives better. They're a, a syncretistic people seeking to sprinkle bits of other cultures, other worldviews, other religions into their commitment to Yahweh. Now, it's interesting, as we look at these, it's not the breaking of some sort of arbitrary standard that God is indicting the people of here. In one of the most important passages in the Old Testament, in Exodus 34, the Lord, he reveals himself to Moses. Moses asks, Matt Ross preached just before this for us a few weeks ago, Moses asks to see his glory. And so the Lord hides him in the cleft of the rock and passes before him. And who does he clear, declare himself to be? He says he is the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, giving mercy to the children of Israel. The Lord is being specific about uh, his indictment against Israel, but if he were to speak broadly, he could very well just say, the problem is that you're not like me. You don't behave in a way that reflects me. And if we remember back to the Garden of Eden, humanity is created to reflect God to the earth. There's a sense in which, right, in being the called out covenant people of God, the church, as we think about this from a new covenant perspective, that onlooking people should be able to look at you and I and to get a glimpse of the glory of God, to see who he is and what he's like. Because we live in such a way that reflects that, that mirrors his goodness. And the Lord is saying, that's not true of Israel. They lack any bit of that. In fact, as they are supposed to bless the nations and lead the nations to worship of Yahweh, the opposite has happened. That they're enthralled by the nations and their fake gods and their idols. There is no faithfulness, there is no steadfast love, and there is no knowledge of God in the land. Now, rather than, I think, just being tacked on to faithfulness and steadfast love, I think we see that no knowledge of God is actually causative of the lack of the other two elements. If Israel were to know who Yahweh is, what he is really like, they would not be milling about with temporary pleasures. If they were to know truly the goodness and the glory of God, they would not find themselves being half-heartedly allegiant toward him. They would be captivated by him, enthralled by him, as they were created to be as his people. And so there's no knowledge of God in the land. And because they do not know him, they do not live in devotion to him. There is no faithfulness. There is no steadfast love. It has been put by a man named Herman Bavink, a Dutch theologian, the path to the heart runs through the head. Or in more contemporary uh, wording, it has been said, the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. We see this description that the people do not know Yahweh and therefore they do not love him. The way I can think maybe best to drive this home to explain this is to describe for you the person that I know best, Kira. When I first, yeah, yeah, buckle up. <laughs> when I first met Kira, one of the things that was uh, so enticing about her that I was um, very pleased with is that she's extraordinarily quiet and reserved. <laughs> In fact, I was immediately attracted to her because I thought 
She's quite short for a woman. <laughs> Her bleach blonde hair really does it for me. Now, if I were to stand up here and to tell you that uh, this is my description of my wife and that I love her dearly, you would say to me, that love means nothing because you don't actually love the person you're describing. You've created someone else or uh, perhaps you've forgotten what your wife is really like. My love for Kira is only as good as me actually knowing who she is and what she's like. And in the same way, the people of Israel must know Yahweh in order to love him. They must know his character, his goodness, and his unfailing mercy. Now, I want us to understand that uh, it would be very easy for us as we read these words to do one of two things. Firstly, to uh, wag our finger at ancient Israel and to say, how dare you be like this? How dare you not be faithful and have steadfast love? Do you not remember what God did for you? Or maybe more contemporarily, it would be so easy for us to extend our gaze beyond the walls of the church and to, be start, uh, and to start thinking about our culture, our society, right? To uh, find ourselves criticizing the godless society that marks most of our world. But rather, I think the first and foremost thing we must do is to consider how true these words are of us. How we are a divided, a double-hearted people, an idolatrous people. How many of us have find ourselves, right? We are uh, certainly content to have Jesus. We speak much of Jesus, but our lives are often marked by, I want Jesus and the American dream. I want the white picket fence. I want the two and a half kids. Uh, I want to drive the nice BMW 3 Series to work. <laughs> or maybe it's, I want Jesus, but I also want to live in such a way that I don't have to depend on him to meet my needs. I want the comfort that keeps me from thinking that uh, I actually have minute by minute, moment by moment, practical dependence on him. I want Jesus, but I also want to be loved by a world that hates him. I want to be highly esteemed in my workplace among people who think that Jesus is a charade and Christianity is a joke. Brothers and sisters, we fall into these categories. These mark our lives like Israel you're an adulterous people with divided hearts, loving things we ought to hate. So if that is what is lacking, verse 2 tells us what is present but ought not to be. We read there is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. Pop quiz for us here. Can anyone tell me what, uh, is there five of these? Yep, what these five uh, indictments have in common. Not, not rhetorical. It could be hard to know, but I am being genuine. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, I heard it from, from several of you. These are the Ten Commandments. Some of them. Half of them, in fact. We see that Yahweh is setting before Israel that you have made these covenant promises to me. I have saved you, and you have said that you would live in such a way as to reflect my saving mercy toward you. But instead, the habit of Israel consistently is to be law breakers. They break the third, ninth, sixth, eighth, and seventh commandment routinely. And in doing so, we know that they break the first, second, and all the other commandments to go along with them. We read that there is swearing, not this idea of profanity that we use this word often to mean, but uh, it's a breaking of the third commandment. They use the name of the Lord in vain. They make promises on his behalf. Some scholars would even suggest that at this point, Israel is uh, kind of using Yahweh in his name in order to try to call down judgment on the surrounding nations. There is swearing. There is lying. Israel has departed from telling the truth to one another. No honesty, no integrity. How many of us have told small, what we might call white lies this week? Let's be honest. Let's think about it. We read that there is murder. Now, I rejoice that as far as I know, no one is actively killing other people in this class. All right. I, I, that's not, not rhetorical or not uh, facetious. I really am grateful for that. But in Matthew 5, we see the way that Jesus ups the ante of the sin of our heart. 
in such a way that he in fact says to be angry with a brother, to speak uh, harshly, to call a brother a fool makes us liable to the fire of hell. Recently through Kira and a couple other of our friends who still serve in high school student ministry, I was told about uh, these two girls who used to be friends, but now they're giving one another the silent treatment. I've been informed of this. And not only is that extraordinarily petty, but that's not my uh, you know, most pressing concern, is that isn't the silent treatment uh, maybe just a, a nicer, we could convince ourselves or a more humane way to kill someone? Think about it with me, to live as if they don't exist, to wish on them that they wouldn't actively be involved or to inhibit my life in any way. We're not actually shedding anyone's blood, but we're saying to them, you might as well be as good as dead to you. We read that there is stealing in the land. Uh, a couple chapters from now, at the end of chapter five, we're going to see these words are said, the princes of Judah have become like those who move the landmark. It's this description of people where uh, rocks would um, represent the end of your property, right? In, in such a way, they didn't have the estate planning that uh, we've been involved in today. And so um, a rock would represent, this is where your boundary line ends, where someone else's land begins. And in the quiet of night, just going to move that just a little bit at a time, taking a, you know, an extra 10th of an acre for yourself. And lastly, we read that they are committing adultery. It is not um, spiritual in the sense that most of the book has been, I don't think. I think they are physically not honoring the commitments of marriage. They are uh, giving themselves to other people who they haven't committed to covenantally love. Once again, brothers and sisters, it's easy to read these words and to point the finger at someone else. But it's much more pressing that we see the ways in which they are a mirror to our own sin which they highlight our own rebellion. When we think about the goodness and the glory of God, hopefully increasingly apparent to us are all of the ways in which we fall short of that. All of what we know we ought to be as God's covenant people and yet are not. All of the ways where our living and our words are not true. All of the ways in which we do not honor the commitments we have made. We are not upright in our financial dealings. We read that they break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. It's sort of a summary statement in my mind. There are no laws that Israel is not brazen enough to break. Even bloodshed being required in order to get what they want no longer stands in their way. They're content to kill if that means they get what they want. And as we come to verse three, we see the consequences of these things. If you'll remember back with me, we see the result of Israel's story in Adam being told over and over again. That relationship with God is broken. Relationships with others are distorted. And lastly, that the whole earth, the whole land suffers as a result of sin. We read, therefore, the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. I sent in my email this week, I hope some of you had occasion to do so, to read Deuteronomy chapter 28, because I think it fills in some of the gaps of what we might need to understand here. That Yahweh, when he brought Israel out of Egypt and he promised to give them and bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey, that he said, I will bless you in your obedience greatly, but I will curse you equally in your disobedience. That if you do not follow my laws and me in my ways, that you will be cursed in the land. And we've talked about throughout our study of Hosea that one of those curses will be exile, being taken out of the good land that God has promised them to dwell and grow in. These verses should be a cold splash of water in the face of anyone who thinks that our sin only impacts us. Anyone who finds ourselves so self-deceived as to believe that my sin only hurts me and no one else. We see that all of the people languish and that all of creation suffers. The beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens. Remember back to 
Genesis 1 and 2, these are the categories in which God has given Adam and Eve to rule over, to have dominion over. But we read that they are taken away. We read even, right? That even word is so interesting. Even the fish of the sea are taken away. The greatest act of judgment that these Israelites could have remembered that God has done would be the flood, right? God, aside from some animal and eight people, destroyed everything and everyone. But even in that, right, because it was done with water, the, the fish of the sea likely turned out okay. They got to swim all over the whole earth, I imagine, for a time. Hosea, speaking on behalf of God, is being, he's picturing, imagining a judgment greater than the flood. A judgment that exceeds the greatest judgment Israel had been familiar with. We see this picture that uh, in sin and of what happens in sin, that the impact is cosmic. It's universal. We can look in our world and there's not a square inch of our universe that is not touched by sin. But that makes the news of the gospel so great. That as the Lord Jesus steps onto the scene, Paul tells us in Colossians 1, in one of these great Christ hymn passages, that this Lord Jesus sent forth by God is reconciling everything to himself. Everything. So that means every square inch of the world impacted by sin, it will be made right. There is nothing that we know of right now that the Lord Jesus is not in his work right now, bringing under his rule and reign and will one day perfectly rule over as king. Brothers and sisters, the effects of sin are massive. They're cosmic. They rage in our hearts and they harm our relationships and they stop us from knowing God as we should. But even as big and grotesque as sin is, the gospel of Jesus Christ is more than sufficient to deal with it. That the Lord Jesus stands ready to reverse the story that's been happening since Genesis 3. He steps onto the scene and he is the one perfectly faithful, perfect in steadfast love, as God knows God. He does not swear, lie, murder, steal, or commit adultery. And therefore, the land that he rules over, the new heaven and the new earth that we anticipate, nothing is taken away from it. None of the land mourns. None of the people languish in that land. And that is our great hope. The gospel is so magnificent for so many reasons. And we see that in Jesus Christ, the Lord is taking a people who are a verse two sort of people, what we are by nature. And he is making us into a people who will one day and are increasingly being faithful to Yahweh, having steadfast love and commitment to him as our God, and who know him in a true and real sense. We know who he is and we know what he's like. I mentioned this in passing, but we're going to see that these verses kind of carry the storyline for a couple chapters here in Israel. As uh, a couple different groups of people, three of them, in fact, will be indicted in the rest of chapter four. We'll see chapter five carrying with it three different warnings for those people. And in chapter six, a threefold call to repentance. But these verses, this indictment of what Israel has done will carry the story forward. And it actually marks the story of God's people until the Lord Jesus steps on the scene. What a glorious savior and king he is. Let me pray for us, and we'll go to our small groups. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the clarity of your word that, Lord, you do not pull punches when it comes to showing us who we really are and what we're really like. But, Lord, you don't leave us as your people in despair. You do not show us what we're like in order that uh, we might despair of life itself. But you remind us of your faithfulness. In all of our failings, you remind us that there is one who did not and has not and will not fail. You remind us that Jesus is the true and better Israel. The one who does everything that your people were created to do, everything that we ourselves have failed to do. Lord, and you remind us that because of his great gospel, 
that we have been reconciled to you. Lord, we thank you for that. We rejoice that that is our one true hope. And we look forward to a day when that is perfectly realized over all the earth. We long for that day in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Um, again, if you don't know uh, what breakout group you're a part of or you need um, some help getting there, feel free to talk to me or really anyone else I'm sure could help you in that direction. And uh, Colette's on here. We have Colette, so there's a uh, there's a few. Of well, us. then life is good if we have Colette. Exactly. Yeah. Colette, you can hear us, right? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? All right, we we can't hear you, but we can take care of that. <laughs> is is the Christian Medical and Dental Society still a thing? It is, yeah. And you're involved in that. Ish. No, I mean, it's like just for case, it's for students. It's still, it's only a student thing. Yeah. Okay. People who are involved are like mentors, which I told Jason I would be once I like know enough to do anything. <laughs> Got it. No, 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 no. It didn't used to be. Yeah. It no. Colette, can okay. you can you try to talk again? And we'll see if we can hear you this time. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, we're back. All Great. Right. You're stuck looking at us, Colette. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, there's a there's just a small group of us this morning, but um, with that, I'd love to just hear uh, life updates from everyone, um, how things have been going at home or at work or school or wherever you find yourselves, and uh, have occasion maybe to think about Hosea and then to pray for one another. So, Colette, do you want to start for us? Would that be all right? Sure. Home is pretty good. Nothing's really changed. I am slowly starting to look at schools, so that's kind of exciting and something to pray for, finding the right school to go back to. Yeah, that that is exciting. Um, are you hoping um, with what that brings about to, to stay around Northeast Ohio? Um, yeah, or what probably does that look so. Like? I'm probably looking okay. at going Great. online somewhere in Northeast Ohio. I'm not really sure yet. There's a lot okay. of different like programs to look through, yeah. but probably something online. Okay. Great. We will play, pray to that end for uh, God's wisdom for you. Thank you. Hoshikos, any life to report? Um, Wednesday, I was involved in a hit and run accident <gasps> oh, no. in my husband's new car. Oh, no. 4,000 miles. So, sort of, sort of new. Uh, it's pretty new. <laughs> um, and he has been nothing but gracious and kind and loving and forgiving. And he's amazing. Um, so I, thankfully, thankfully there wasn't, I was not hurt at all. The car now, the word from the body shop, it's worse than we would have thought, I think. Um, but 
providentially, because it's only God, somebody witnessed it, chased the car down, took a photograph and came back and reported to the police. Wow. wow. Like, I'm shocked. I still have to do something for these people. So, um, so we don't know. Like we're caught in that way, you know, the cops like, yeah, we'll have the report out in a week, you know, so we're stuck in that limbo. So I don't know. I don't know what that means. You know, worst case scenario, our insurance makes us pay our deductible because they don't have insurance. Okay. Uh, worst, worst case, I have to go to court. I don't want to do that. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, you know. And I mean, thankfully, it was a route. It was six blocks from home, okay. but it's not on my route to work. So I'm having, I mean, in this group, it's not really PTSD, but it feels yeah, like yeah, it a little yeah. bit, no, no. you know, so I see a car and I, you know, freak out a little bit. So, but it could be worse because it wasn't on my way to work. It wasn't in my vehicle. Everything is very different, mm -hmm. you know, but that's my life update. I'm sorry. That, that stinks. Well, I'll tell you, you know, words good enough in all situations. I mean, yeah. it, it, I, I had the day off that day, so I was able to zoom on over there. Um, I still got done everything that I wanted to get done that day. The, the claims part, I probably took, I couldn't believe how quickly that went. I got a rental car that afternoon, so. It really, truly is just inconvenient. Right. I mean, it could be a lot worse. So. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about this person that hit and run. I mean, you know, it's some young black woman because Ruth Ann saw this lady. And who knows what, what made her run off like that. Mm -hmm. She probably doesn't have insurance. Maybe she doesn't even have her license anymore. Who knows? Got scared. Got scared and just took off. So I don't, I don't know. But you're okay. Yeah. Thank you. Too. So. But yeah, that was our excitement for the week. That sounds like plenty of excitement. <laughs> Not the good kind, though. Yeah, no. Here, <laughs> you got anything for us? Any life updates? We're trying to buy a house. It's going questionably well. That sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. We were supposed to close last week, but didn't happen. So maybe this week. I don't know. I was like, in some small ways, like, not that I'm not excited, but like, I haven't seen this house in eight weeks now. Like, it's eight weeks since we put an offer in because everything's wow. moved so slow. So I'm like, I mean, yeah, I'm theoretically excited about buying a theoretical house that I haven't seen in two months. <laughs> Get it driven by? I'd be going that way every, every time. I know. I've thought church. about creeping. I really have. But yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. We're like a little closer to like our have to move out date than I would like to be. So mm -hmm. there was a couple of days this week where I was like, hmm, what if we have no place to live? This will be a fun adventure. You have a place to live. Thanks. I have a big driveway. You can just pod your stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Parts, yeah. So yeah, we'll see. It's been one of those things where it's like just a small thing that I think can like when there's already a lot of stress, like one small thing makes it seem like a lot bigger deal than it actually is. So yeah, yep, yep, yep. So just trying to remember that like micromanaging actually is not the godly way to handle it. <laughs> <laughs> as much as that's my normal bent. So yeah. I don't know. So like worst case scenario, could it fall through or not? It's yours? I don't know. I don't know how any of this oh, yeah. works. I don't. I don't think it would fall through. Not either. at this point. So like the you had three points where it probably could have. Yeah. Okay. Think, things have changed from the seller and us being in opposition. We told you guys about yeah. some of what happened with that. Now it's us and the seller on the same team and the lender just kind of like dilly dallying. Got it. Okay. So that would I mean certainly possible, but seem very out of the blue if right. things weren't right, right, right. So that's but all. like as a praise. Dave is Dave Schlero is our like our real estate agent and he's just been so great through all of it and like if this was someone we didn't know and trust this would be way more stressful yeah mm -hmm. than just being able to text Dave and be like hey like what's going on like what do we need to do is this normal you know so having a friend on our team has been really nice yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, great. It's a learning curve for him. The Lord has called you to be involved. I know. She thanks. I know. <laughs> Um, but he'll be better having worked yeah. through all this and and he's yeah, the day you'll cool as a cucumber during all of it yeah. cool good yeah i i think we lord willing if we were ever to sell this house and move again we'll be grateful for having gone through this experience and seeing some of the hiccups that could come about so right. if we ever do experience a smooth house buying process <laughs> we'll be uh yeah very grateful for it I don't have much more to add to that. Um, interviewed residents this week. So that was a, a big part of my time. And uh, it's a weird reality that you guys know these residents really well and are, uh, yeah, some of them your son's age. So yeah, your, your it's son, weird. Youngest son's age. Yeah. It's weird. Kind of like the cop that came Wednesday that I probably have shoes older than him. <laughs> <laughs> I also got my second COVID vaccine on Friday, so I'm really pumped about that. I did feel really terrible. Fair warning. Oh, yeah, I got really sick. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm not okay looking, now. I'm not looking forward to that. Yeah, I have to preemptively take Tylenol because I got like a really bad fever, chills, body Ooh. aches. Okay. Whole thing, but it's okay. I'm back to normal today, so it's fine. Worth it. Yeah, but I was trying to sign up for the. We're in the 50 plus. Yes, and so it's open soon. Well, it's already open. Yeah, yeah. But there's no way I can sign up. I mean, it's like you click the button, it says waiting, waiting, and then nothing happens. And then it's like full already. And then, uh, no appointments within 50 miles. So it's like, yeah. If I hear anything at UH, I'll text you. Okay. I did sign up for UH for both Ruthann and I. Actually, list for the I waiting think, list. yeah, we're on the waiting list for the waiting list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that sounds about right with all of this. So. Uh, I didn't write any discussion questions this week. I don't think I had it clear in my head that we were going to uh, small groups. So um, well, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Fill me out here. So um, one, one thing that these passages always make me think about is how how to balance the the national versus the individual mm -hmm. because in Hosea it's all the national in fact most of the Old Testament seems more like you know Israel is the whole mm -hmm. as opposed to the individual you know? yeah and where do you, I mean like you were pointing out you know this kind of sin is everywhere. It's not. So what makes it unique to this period of time that the Lord is going to, you know, come down on Israel? Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, yeah. Something that it, it makes me think about um, is that although these, as we highlighted, a lot of these things still mark our lives today, um, in ways that they, they shouldn't, and we recognize that, that um, in the rebellion of the wicked people of Israel, that there was never repentance, mm. um, like never a, acknowledge, a true acknowledgement before God and a turning from their ways. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways in which our new covenant experience of this is different, that like as we, as we read this text and, and see ourselves in this position, that we by the Holy Spirit and power can turn and change and, and hopefully do these things well. So, but yeah, if anyone else had thoughts on it, certainly love to hear them. I remember going to, th this sort of also plays into politics almost, mm -hmm. where um, you know, certainly sin has national implications, sort of like what this was saying, you know, with the land mourns. Yeah sinful nations as a whole just ultimately won't prosper. And you can look, you know, like Haiti is a perfect example of that. I was talking with um, uh, the MAF, Mike, Mike, Ross, Mike yeah. who was just there. And he was saying just how that, that whole country is just really into voodoo. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they're, they're living it every day. So you have that that consequence of sin that's just nationally, you know, 
you know, the the rain falls on the godly and the ungodly. Well, you can sort of turn that around too. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're sin, well, the effects of sin will affect the godly and the ungodly yeah. as a nation. So that that was just something that I think about. I was and I was gonna say I heard someone um preach on the Sermon on the Mount. Or no, no, I'm sorry. It was the um, the uh, the Good Samaritan, and he he took that he took that and applied it nationally, hmm. not as just you know you're driving somewhere and helps. But he he said, well, what if he just did these thought experiments where he applied it to a larger group? The whole state. So shouldn't you vote for all these very liberal agenda things? I'm not sure that works either. Yeah. So I've always had those questions. How do you apply that nationally or individually? Certainly it's individual. I mean, but but it is interesting, like in our culture where I think our knee jerk is to apply it individually and rarely, you know, you know what I mean? Like where we our current cultural moment says like Christianity is for you as a person individually and whatever that means to you is what matters. Right. And we have to encourage people to be part of the body. Whereas like in Israel, Old Testament, like they experience their faith primarily collectively and often like we're, it seems like maybe more prone to miss it individually. Mm. I'm also just reading through numbers right now, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm reading all about like this tribe marched at this time, like in this order. You know, like all of the directions were collective, like directions, not like Mac, you walk over there. You know. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm always just, you know, for the longest time you read about the Old Testament and how Israel wasn't faithful, but you know, then they would come back and they'd forget. But I always have to train myself that we're talking about generations. Mm -hmm. You know, they had whole generations that were faithful. Mm -hmm. And 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 yet even today there's still a people that can identify as Jewish, mm -hmm. you know, going all the way back to these times. I can't imagine my family. I mean, shoot, how many of us even know who our great 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 grandparents were? Right. Yeah. You know, to know like what tribe you what tribe you were to. from yeah it's like wow the lord really kept these people i guess individually we do still see like faithful people amidst unfaithfulness right like where joshua and caleb are like promised that they will see the promised land except for everybody else in israel is going to die before they get to go into the promised land right like yeah yeah it's it's interesting because i don't think you don't see a lot of this in hosea but like they're there were faithful people in this time, and maybe maybe Hosea is standing alone as as one of them, but like that there were a, a righteous remnant of people living in the midst of yeah, of people who who were turning back on Yahweh. But it is interesting. Uh, I think those are great questions of how do you think through those things, of what implications they have for today in the things that we not only want to live unto the Lord, but how we want to see our lives and the spheres and communities in which we live impacted by the, yeah, the positive things that biblical morality brings about. Yeah, you know, I was doing another thought experiment with my kids and I said, you know, if everyone lived according to the principles laid out for us by them, just think of it. You would have no problems with you wouldn't even need a contract for mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there wouldn't have to worry about probably a whole class of diseases, mm -hmm. you know. Yep. It's just incredible. Getting runs wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So kind of amazing to think about the the economic costs of sin is mm -hmm. massive.
autonomous behavior. We have five minutes. Um, how can we pray for one another until we see each other again next week? Colette, are there any ways we can pray for you outside of wisdom for making decisions about school? Uh, just getting my sleep schedule back in order. Daylight savings totally like killed it. Aww. Yeah, it's been a rough morning. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait till they just get rid of it all together. Soon enough. It seemed like some meaningless. Because we can pray for you and yours. But we're looking forward to the this, the church plant mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've been excited, and then it's it's also sort of hard thinking about it here. I don't know. I mean, that's it's going to be a long transition. So we we need a place to meet. Just how the Lord directs in that whole process. You guys have been here for a long time. Yeah, since the 70s, me at least. So, although, when I first started coming, we were meeting pretty much where we're trying to go back. <laughs> <laughs> we were uh, joking, we had an elders meeting yesterday, and some of the guys were about uh calling it the chapel, get rid of the yeah. Parkside, the Heights, and just call it the chapel, the chapel. and plant it back there. So That's hilarious. We'll keep that in mind when it comes to naming. Yeah. <laughs> you know what like, I mean? I got an idea. What's going to be really funny is if we bought that, the old yeah, the, chapel building. The old Beachwood, building. Yeah. Which is a, which is a uh, synagogue now. Yes. But nope. that's exciting. Yeah, it's yeah. been uh, we've been encouraged to hear Dan's updates about how the informational meetings are going. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to the, the prayer meeting starting next week. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, can I have two volunteers to pray for us and then we'll transition to service? I should pray. Thank you, Dan. I can't do. Thanks, Gear. Lord, we are just so thankful for the way your word speaks to us. Uh, thank you for the the um, this prophecy from Hosea that even though he was speaking to Israel so many years ago, that it still speaks to us today. And Lord, we, we um, are so mournful for sin as a nation and sin as individuals. And we pray, Lord, that you will uh, bring repentance to um, our nation and you will um, heal the land that, that you've given us. But I also um, thank you that uh, you uh, protected Rudan in this um, and that really, Lord, even in the inconvenience of it all, it's not a major setback for us or anything like that. And Lord, I also pray that um, you'll help uh, Colette when she looks for schools, give her wisdom Help her to find a good program that's a good fit for her and help her to uh, really make the, make the most of her time in, in that school choice and that you would direct her paths um, even beyond school too, Lord. We thank you uh, for her and her example of being so faithful to this class. All these things in Jesus' name, amen. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you give us your word and your spirit and each other, Lord, and um, thank you that you 
can change us, that we don't have to stay the unfaithful, those who lack steadfast love, Lord, but instead you can transform us from one degree of glory to another to look a little bit more like Jesus, Lord, and I pray that you would do that for us this week, that you would continue to change us, you would soften our hearts and show us our sin and um, teach us repentance, Lord, and Lord, we're thankful for this time together to study your word. We're thankful for Hosea, Lord. We pray that you would write it on our hearts, um, that you wouldn't give us big heads, that you would give us soft hearts, Lord. And um, I pray for the Hoshikos and for um, all of the plant, for Dan and Olivia as they um, prepare to, to make this move, Lord. And um, Lord, we do ask that you would open a space for them, that you would um, provide the right, place for them and in the right neighborhood and that you would begin to soften hearts even there, Lord, to draw people to yourself in the heights, Lord. And um, we're grateful for the gospel churches that are there. And we, we pray that this partnership would be fruitful and um, that their unity, Lord, would glorify you. Pray for um, Ruth Ann and Dan as they start to make this transition and say goodbye to a place that they've been at for so long, Lord. And, and that's even true of of so many other really faithful people who are leaving, Lord, and I pray you would you would knit them together, um, that they would be the body of Christ to one another, and you would encourage them and build true community, Lord, focused on your word and um, effectively share the gospel through the way that they live. Um, I pray that you would give them an extra measure of grace and peace in this season when um, church planting is normally so hard, but this is even harder. God, we pray that you would um, you would bless them as they go and you would help us to love them well in it. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Colette, thanks for joining us. Have a good, Have a good week. week. Thank you too, Colette.